So in this first question, it says figure one shows a pendulum pulled to the right hand side. Remember a pendulum will oscillate and do a cycle. That is a quarter of a cycle, that is half a cycle, that is three quarters, and that is back to a whole cycle. So it says the pendulum is released and starts to swing. Figure two shows how the displacement of the pendulum changes with time. Well, the displacement is the distance from the mean position or the undisturbed position. So that will be your displacement. Give the time taken for one complete cycle. Well, if you have a look here, it starts at plus 0 0.2. Zero is here, minus 0 0.2 is there. So then it goes back back to zero and back to where it started. So that is one complete cycle. And you can see that that is two, and be careful to check your units here, that's two seconds. Which statement correctly describes the amplitude of the oscillations in figure one? I would not read these statements. I'd look to see what happens to the amplitude first. And the amplitude is the maximum displacement from the mean position. And you can see the amplitude is getting steadily less as the time increases, which means it has to be D. The learner uses a different pendulum. The time for one complete oscillation is five seconds. Calculate the frequency. It's interesting, in the later exams, you are now given the equation in the question to say you have to look at the equation sheet at the back. So, of course, uh, I would first rewrite the equation. Frequency is 1 over the time period. You need to calculate frequency, so you don't need to arrange it. So just put in your values and work out the answer. 1 over 5 is 0 0.2. Figure 3 shows the emission spectra of four elements W, X, Y and Z. The emission spectra of an unknown substance is also included in figure 5. Identify the elements contained in the unknown substance. Remember, emission spectrum are produced when you get metals as a vapour and you excite them and they produce line spe spectra which you can see with a diffraction grating. So all you need to do is identify which lines are in the unknown. So you can see element W has two lines here which aren't in there, so it can't be W. Element X has a line there and a line there, so that element is in the unknown substance. Element Y has two lines there which are in it, that line there, that line there, so it is that one as well. And we've only got two of them. But to double check, you can see Z is not one of them. So it is X and Y, which is C. A hydrogen lamp contains hydrogen atoms. Light from the hydrogen atom is used to produce an emission spectra. Figure 4 shows the visible part of the emission spectra of a hydrogen. So you can see it produces four different coloured lines. The emission spectra is a set of coloured lines on a black background. Each coloured line has a specific frequency. Explain why hydrogen atoms only produce light at specific frequencies. You may include diagrams to support your answer. When it says that, it's giving you a hint that actually it's much easier if you do that. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to sketch a diagram, then I explain what I would write. So first of all, remember that the electrons in the hydrogen gas have to be excited, which means they jump up to higher energy levels. So I would just draw uh, a few energy levels here and label them energy levels. And then the electrons uh, get excited, they absorb energy, and they jump up to higher energy levels. And when they jump up to higher energy levels, they then fall back down, uh, emitting uh, energy as light um, in the form of photons. So you can see those are photons of light. And the more energy is emitted, the higher the frequency and therefore a different colour.
So what would I put for my three marks as well as sketching that? Well, the first thing I need to say is the electrons in the uh, atom are excited and go up to higher energy levels because you're heating the gas or sending electrical current through it. So the electrons in a hydrogen atom absorb energy when the gas is heated. They move up to higher energy levels. These excited electrons then fall back down, emitting energy in the form of light photons. Different frequencies are produced depending on the change in energy. So part C says, describe how diffraction grating affects the light from a hydrogen lamp. Well, it's only worth two marks, so it's not about explaining um, how it produces a line spectra for two marks, but that is included in the mark scheme. So I would say, first of all, that when light goes through the slit, it diffracts, it spreads out and overlaps. And where you get bright light is where um, the same frequency of light um, interferes constructively because the path difference is a whole wavelength. When light passes through the slit, it diffracts, spreads out. Where the light overlaps, it interferes. Bright lines are produced when it constructively interferes with the same frequency the path difference is one wavelength. So it said the red line in the hydrogen emission spectra has a wavelength of 656 nanometers. Be very careful when you get these questions to look for prefixes. Nano is equal to times 10 to the minus 9 meters and you really need to learn your prefixes. So that's the first thing I would do. I would, as I was reading that, rewrite that as 656 times 10 to the minus 9 meters. The speed of light is 6.00 times 10 to the 8. So that's my speed. And I've got to calculate the frequency using that equation. So first of all, I've got to rearrange it. And if you're not particularly strong at rearranging equations, I would suggest putting it into a triangle where the two things that multiply each other, frequency and wavelength, go at the bottom, which means speed must go there. We want to work out frequency. So if you cover up frequency, it's speed over wavelength. So it's speed divided by wavelength. Then put your values in. And your answer is 4.57 times 10 to the 10 hertz. You would have got um, 3 out of 4 marks if you didn't change from nanometers to meters. Question 3. Many cars have rain sensors attached to the windscreen. The rain sensors automatically switch on the car's windscreen wipers when it rains. The rain sensor consists of a light source and a light detector. Figure 5 shows the light travelling from the light source to the light detector. When the light reaches the light detector, the windscreen wiper does not turn on. So you can see you've got a piece of glass here and when light goes into the glass it refracts and then you can see here it totally internally reflects and it keeps doing that and when it comes out here it refracts again and the light is detected so as long as it's dry light is detected so of course the first thing is what are the effects the first is refraction and the second one is total internal reflection Figure 6 shows what happens to the ray of light when there is a raindrop on the windscreen. The raindrop increases the critical angle of light from 42 degrees to 62 degrees. Explain why the windscreen wiper turns on when the rain falls on the windscreen. It's worth three marks. You need to make a minimum of three statements. 
First of all, look very carefully at the picture. You can see that here, uh, this is 45 degrees, that's your angle of incidence. And you can see that it's no longer totally internally reflecting because uh, the angle of incidence must be less than the critical angle, which you can see now has raised to 62 degrees and therefore it refracts and escapes and so no light is detected by the light detector. So this is how I would answer the question. First of all, you don't have to know that that's 45 degrees, but you must make sure you are clear that that angle of instance is now less than the critical angle. No light is received by the light detector because the angle of incidence is now less than the critical angle. So the light refracts into the air, open brackets, escapes. Question four says, analog and digital electronic signals are used for communication. Sketch a graph of an analog signal. Well, of course, an analog signal has any uh, number of values. It has an infinite number of values. So when you sketch this, make sure you don't have any flat parts and make sure you don't go back on yourself, but it can literally be anything you like. So that is my analog signal. Explain one advantage of using electronic digital signals instead of using analog signals for communication. Well, for me, the best one is this. Remember, both analog and digital signals pick up noise. So if that was an analog signal, when it picked up noise, it might look like that. A digital signal, when it picks up noise, might look a bit like that. Because analog signals have an infinite number of values, you cannot tell what is noise and what isn't noise. So when you amplify it at the receiving end, you get the noise as well. Whereas you can still see that that's a one, that's a zero, that's the one. So you can regenerate this signal back to its original. So you can actually take the noise out. And I think that's by far the best um, answer, which means that digital signals have a much better quality. Digital signals have a much better quality because although they pick up noise as well as analog signals, they can be cleaned up, regenerated. And here is um, the other things you could have said. Remember, each thing must be a paired answer. So why is it better and explaining it? So you could have can be regenerated to travel longer distances, improved quality of reception, so less noise or interference, that's really the same thing. Multiplexing, remember digital signals can be multiplexed, um, which means they can carry more channels so they can send more information per second, whereas analog signals can't be. And finally, um, this one, um, I'm not sure about that pairing really, but uh, remember digital signals, um, because they are um, on the whole light signals, um, they cannot be intercepted, whereas radio uh, signals or electrical signals uh, produce a magnetic field and so they can be hacked, um, uh, they can be listened into. So this is much more secure. But I think that is the best one to choose. So nice easy one here. It says identify the correct coding for the series of pulses. Well, that's one, zero, one, one, zero. So it is D. Finally, the last question is always a six mark question. And it says infrared and Bluetooth are both used for short range uh, wireless communication. Compare the similarities and differences of the waves produced by infrared and Bluetooth. So first of all, I would always do the similarities first and then the differences. And you can bullet point these. It makes the examiner much prefers it than massive amounts of um, words in an essay because they can find the key facts to give you marks to much quicker. So first thing is remember that they are both part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, and because they're waves, they transfer energy. They also travel at the same speed, the speed of light. 
and they are transverse waves. All electrolytes are transverse. So those are the similarities. Similarities. Both are electromagnetic waves. Both are transverse waves. Both travel at the speed of light, 3 times 10 to the 8. Both carry energy. So when you're looking at differences, I would start with wavelength and the type of electromagnetic wave. I'll then talk about frequency, then go on to line of sight, or can it travel through walls? Um, and then finally, what about the interference? So let's do one at a time. Firstly, their wavelength. Remember, infrared has a higher wavelength than Bluetooth because Bluetooth is a radio signal. So remember, we have radio, we have microwaves, then we have infrared. So I'll make it really clear to examiner that we're now talking about differences and the first one would be wavelength. Wavelength. Infrared has a much shorter wavelength than Bluetooth, which uses radio signals. Frequency. The next thing to consider is infrared frequency. Has a much infrared higher frequency has a much Bluetooth. higher frequency than Bluetooth, which are radio waves. So infrared has a much larger bandwidth, so it can carry more data per second. You don't have to know that Bluetooth is 2.8 megahertz. So infrared can carry much more data per second as it has a larger bandwidth. The next property to consider is line of sight. So infrared will get absorbed by walls, but Bluetooth will travel through walls, so it doesn't need line of sight. Line of sight. Infrared cannot travel through walls, so needs line of sight. Bluetooth can travel through walls. The last thing to consider is interference and what differences there are. So infrared uh, suffers from interference from bright sunlight and Bluetooth uh, has to use frequency hopping because it can interfere with other Bluetooth devices or Wi-Fi which also use the same frequency. Interference. Bright sunlight interferes with infrared signals. Other Bluetooth devices and Wi-Fi can interfere with the Bluetooth signal. This can be reduced by frequency hopping. 